Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jason Harmon, CTO at Stoplight and host of API Intersection podcast. Uh, I've been super excited all week about uh, our little webinar here today. Um, I know we're kind of titled style guides on this, uh, but just to be clear, uh, we're really talking about Spectral, uh, our wildly popular open source project. And uh, it, it's now like way bigger than Stoplight itself, right? Uh, the number of folks using Spectral is overwhelming, especially for our tiny little company. Uh, and so we reached out to some of the folks that we think have been either from a contribution standpoint, incredibly impactful, or um, we also do everything we can to find out about people doing cool stuff with Spectral. Uh, so the group of folks that have joined today uh, have done all of the above. Uh, great contributions, good collaboration with us on around Spectral, and they're doing cool stuff at their jobs. Uh, and so we wanted to kind of get those stories out there. I think the, we've struggled a bit on like, what's the right sort of place for the Spectral community to share these stories. So I don't know if this is the best one, but we're going to kick it off here and uh, see if we can do better with that uh, for the rest of the year. So with that, uh, Oh, introducing our guests real quickly, we've got Alex Savage from Advanced uh, out of the UK. So thanks for staying up late for us. Uh, Alexi Akimov from Monite. Uh, Alexi, where are you at? I don't remember. So uh, I work in Amsterdam, but I'm based in Harlem. This is a small city next to Amsterdam. Right. So you're also staying up late for us. Thank you. And uh, Mike Kistler from Microsoft. So guys, thanks for joining. Um, I thought maybe we could take a, just one or two minutes a piece and maybe kind of tell us high level what you're doing with sort of style guides and spectral, either in the organizations you're in now or kind of things you've done in the past that have built up your experience with it. So I'm just going to go with kind of faces in the order they show up here. Uh, so Alex, uh, tell us your story. Yeah, sure. So um, can you hear me okay? Yep, lovely. Um, so I've been advanced for eight years. Advanced are a company with a lot of products and we grow through acquisition. So about four years ago, uh, I got a task from our CTO saying, hey, we need an API manager for all these APIs, right? And um, so we went out and tried some API managers. This is when full API lifecycle managers were in vogue. So people are going out looking at a Kong or a MuleSoft, and that's going to solve all your problems. And what we actually found out that that wasn't the right thing for us. And actually we needed to kind of look again and say before we spend all this money on an api manager and a nice dealership to put all of your apis into a dev portal we actually needed to start again and work out what does a good api look like and that's really where we discovered open api and then that fed us very quickly through to uh to using spectral and the tools there to say it's not only good enough today to have a valid open api it's really going to have a, a voice or a style that reflects your brand and Spectral is a tool that saves us hundreds of people days every year in terms of reviews and also in terms of just putting good APIs out the door first time. Cool. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Alexi, how about you? Uh, yeah, I think my story is very similar, basically. Um, I mentioned currently I'm working at Monite as a small startup, but before that I was working for Adyen uh, for six years. Adyen, as you can imagine, it's a big, big uh, payment service provider headquartered here in the Netherlands. And about four years ago, I, I took a role of, of head of API uh, at Adyen. And you can imagine we already had like several dozens of teams working on APIs for more than a decade. And then the task was, okay, how can we make sure that everything is consistent, it's working properly, and then we can move fast. And obviously, there are a lot of efforts you can do around API management and governments. We started with initiatives like API console and things like that. But also, we looked at the style guides. We realized quickly that no existing style guide can fit us. Let's invent our own style guide. <laughs> uh, very common practice. And uh, obviously, uh, after creating a style guide, we realized that uh, there are so many rules and we just cannot survive without any automation. Obviously, we were already using Open API and then Spectral just came in naturally and it was an amazing experience. And about a year and a half ago, I switched to a small startup because I wanted to experience something myself to build a new API platforms from scratch. And obviously the same question uh, came up again, how can we make sure that this API is very, very good? Uh, and uh, 
basically we started applying spectral even more in our day-to-day -day work because we were able to come up with all the rules from from the beginning we included now ci cd pipelines and things like that and we saw a lot of benefits of using that and uh, then we also decided okay let's not repeat the same mistake and keep it um, only internally let's share on github so that everybody can just come and start using it that's uh, what I, i'm also advocating for right now that everybody every company should share the style guides as much as possible yeah, definitely. Uh, more than a few years back, I worked at Braintree and uh, uh, did a bunch of integration work with audience. So I can definitely vouch there's a bunch of APIs behind the scenes. <laughs> All right, Mike, what you got? All right. Well, so I'm currently working at Microsoft. Uh, before that, I was working at IBM. And in both of those uh, cases, I basically came at uh, API governance and API style guides from the point of view of code generation. Uh, we had SDK generators and, uh, you know, quickly learned that um, if you want to have a good SDK come out, if it's generated from an API, you have to have a good API going in. And, uh, and, and, and not only good in terms of, uh, you know, its um, conformance to the spec and things like that, but good in terms of it, it has the patterns that your generators are expecting, right? Uh, uh, so that um, uh, so that your generators can can interpret what the spec says, uh, what what the API definition says properly. So um, so at IBM we had built our own um, validator, uh, and then when we discovered Spectral, we said, hey, this is really cool, and we just sort of built it underneath the covers of our validator. Um, and, and incorporated it, uh, mostly because Spectral allows you to add rules, you know, on the fly. Uh, you can just say, oh, I want to, you know, uh, add this rule, or I want to change the, the severity of this rule. And that was something that our validator didn't support. Building it in would have been really hard. So we just said, look, we'll just build Spectral in underneath. And when I came to Microsoft, it was the same story. There was a, an existing validator that was there. It was written in C sharp, as most things are in Microsoft. Uh, and uh, uh, um, but we wanted to do things like add custom rules and and be more flexible and things like that. And so we eventually um, pulled Spectral in underneath, and we now use Spectral. We also uh, use use Spectral sort of standalone because uh, it's very easy to use from things like VS Code. And you can just pull up an API spec in VS Code and uh, have the spectral rules run and flag all the lines right there. And it's it's very, very easy. So that's my story. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that we're always trying to kind of hear more stories about, learn more about is uh, what are kind of some of the adoption challenges that you see with these things? So you know, in, in my view, you guys are sort of playing this this governor role within uh, these companies, right? Someone who's trying to sort of curate the rules, determine what they should be for the whole company. And, uh, you know, in my experience, if you turn to a large mass of developers and say, do this, they're guaranteed not to. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're bound to have had some challenges in getting these things adopted. Um, you know, what have you guys seen and kind of what are maybe some tactics you've applied to sort of get over the hump? And uh, I'm going to start with Mike, uh, my fellow Austin area. Uh, all right. All right. Engineer. Yeah, I know so you guys have had some struggles, so I'd love to we, share we, it. We have had some struggles. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to do um, at Microsoft now is treat our, um, evolve our API governance function into something that we call API stewardship. So we want, we want to really partner with teams rather than govern teams. We want to help them understand uh, the reasons that our rules exist, our guidance exist, uh, what can happen when those things aren't followed, um, and, uh, and then just really sort of leave it to the service team to hopefully take that into account and, uh, and then make the best decision. Um, so uh, it's, it's a bit of a struggle because um, there's a lot of education that has to be done. Uh, there are a lot of teams that that don't understand Open API, uh, that don't understand HTTP, uh, that don't understand the conventions there, and so so we have to bring them along uh, quite a bit. But um, but we're starting to do that, and and so far uh, we think it, it's working. 
I'm just going to refute one thing you said a little bit. I'm on a campaign this year that we're, we need to reclaim the word governance. It's okay to say it. It's not a bad word. <laughs> you don't have to say the G word. What you're describing is just good governance. It's modern governance, right? right. Let's not do it the old school giant committees, you know, wait to get in the queue kind of way. Right. Uh, it's okay to govern good. <laughs> uh, sorry, Jason. Yeah, very, very good point. Because when we were discussing this at Adyen, this was exactly like the, 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 one of the topics. How can we make sure that all these teams, uh, they perceive uh, this government or the, the, this this new uh, body uh, in a well in a good way? And one of the solutions was let's call it something like API review group. So it's a group of people who helps you with API reviews. So it's not a government, it's not a board, it's not something who tells you what to do. It's not API police, uh, it's more somebody who is enabling you, uh, which I think worked very well. Yeah, I'm going to call on a word that you just said there. We, we used to call it the center for enablement. So we totally took that from MuleSoft. They talk about a C4E. They say, you know, don't be the API police because it's just a way to alienate yourself. Some people won't want to engage with you. But if you're there saying, here's some tools, here's a, here's some guide guidelines. Like even the word rules is, is a bit on the edge. We always try and say they're guidelines or a style guide. So, you know, this is what best practice looks like. This helps you go fast and make good stuff. It's not here to be restrictive or to really ruin your day. It's there to help you get something which provides value and is going to be safe and is going to be extensible for the future. You know, we want to make good things. I think it was Keith Casey at API Days a few years ago said, as developers, we want two things. We want to make useful stuff. We want to go home on time. So that, that's really a good guiding principle for having API standards, help your teams to do that. Yeah, that's definitely an old Keithism. I've heard that one many times. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the the enablement concept is something that certainly from the podcasts and, and customers and whatnot we hear a lot is like that sort of old school like center of excellence model that like we have a group that's excellent that you need to pass muster with that just culturally that stuff doesn't work anymore. And, you know, the way I always put it is like, you know, uh, if, if I'm working in that kind of role, is uh, I'm here to make you look cool, right? Like, uh, you know, you don't want to go launch your API and then have, you know, 10,000 developers hurling rocks at you because you did something that was inconsistent with the other 10 APIs that are out there. Um, you know, do your thing, you know your domain, but we're going to make you look cool, right? We're going to make you look like everybody else. Um, so that's definitely key. Um, in terms of, uh, I guess, taking it a level deeper into uh, how you're curating these rule sets, you know, you, in most companies, it's like three to five people that are sort of heading up these sorts of things. Um, how, are, are you pushing to get more contribution to these rule sets from kind of, say, your domain architects or sort of other groups? Um, and how do you sort of handle that collaboration? Okay, well, um, for me, uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, external contribution to our rule set. Um, there's a, a very small group of folks um, that uh, build the rules, you know, uh, update our PR pipelines with the rules. Um, and um, occasionally we get feedback, you know, to say, hey, I, you know, I don't understand why this rule is there, or uh, you know, you're you're this is a false positive, and you shouldn't be firing it. And and sometimes they're right, and then it's that same small group of folks that go and fix it. Um, it would be great to have a a, a broader um, contribution base, uh, but uh, everybody's so busy, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's that's the way it is for us. No, we're the same. We've got a team of in total, I think we've got 11 people in our team now that are responsible for it. And I think what we were talking about the other day, Mike, we're in that same situation. We make custom rules because you see something in a review and you go, I didn't have to see that as a human being. And I think that is really where, where the cost saving for your internal governance teams comes in is you know, before Spectral, it was look at a multi-thousand line API definition in OAS, in YAML, eyeball it and just say, is that right? Is that good? You know, we, we had an API that returned application JSON, J-A-S-O-N. 
you're triggering the eye twitch. Yeah, and, and that's that. That is the it. truth. There are so many people out there still doing this, and this is what you, you know. You look at. Uh, we also use the VS Code plugin for Spectral. Um, look at the number of downloads it has on the VS Code Marketplace, and then you look at something like uh, Forty Two Crunch have an open API editor. They've got like over a hundred thousand downloads. And I would challenge you say, why isn't everybody who's using open API using a linter like this? Because it's genuinely, I had one of my teams say, I can't live without Spectral, it's a game changer. You know, they just see the benefit of it. And that's not one of my people. That's just a developer or an engineer who's using it going, I couldn't do APIs without it. Yeah, my situation, I think, is very similar, uh, although it's a small startup, and in a startup, you just encourage everybody to contribute. Everybody is wearing multiple hats, uh, and everybody is welcome to contribute to the quality of API and rules. But the challenge is that is everybody is wearing multiple hats. They're so busy. <laughs> they don't want to go deeper because it's already too much. And in this case, um, we have a group of seven people reviewing APIs like on a weekly basis, uh, uh, like being in a room all together, but also on a daily basis, just receiving all the requests from all the teams. And this helps us understand and see the common patterns and if something is missing in our rules or something isn't correct. So people are just flagging this and then there should be one, one person usually it's me going and updating these rules in Spectral because like knowing how to code it in JSON schema json schema uh and uh, like uh, really automating it it's also a special uh trick that not everybody ha just has time to learn maybe quickly that's unfortunate but what we also do in this group we do the rotation so basically every two three months there are new members and this helps to spread the knowledge within the organization that hey like this is how we do things here and this is probably what we should challenge and this is where we can find uh, the information and this is how we can do this so this is in a nutshell, and that's still a challenge because ideally I would prefer much more people to contribute to that. I don't know how to achieve that. Maybe we can make a room with Alex, Mike, and Jason uh, like every week and review rules of each other and then come up with a common strategy. Maybe this can help. I don't know. Um, yeah, I feel like this whole discussion today is just going to be constantly triggering trauma of... Uh of what reviews were like before automated linters <laughs> uh, the hours i've spent digging through those things trying not to miss something and always missing something uh it's brutal so um alexi I, I, i'm particularly curious. well i guess first off i should have asked a question up front is how large of organizations are we talking about you you guys have already kind of mentioned relatively small numbers of people working on these things but alexi i'm particularly curious at sort of the scale difference between Audion and um, and Monite uh, in terms of like people or developers or however you want to express it. Yeah, basically when I left Audion two years ago, it was around 3,000 people. And now I have uh, like, I, I don't know, 40 plus and half of this is engineering. So it's uh, quite, quite a small group of wow. people. Uh, and this is like a drastic change, but the amount of APIs, because we're a PFS company, and this was the exciting reason for me to join, and the amount of APIs is maybe only one, one fifth of what Adin is doing. So it's already growing very fast and it's very easy uh, to miss things. Uh, they make really fast, uh, something goes uh, out of hands. So that's why automation is the key. That's why what you mentioned, like Spectral helps you really make sure that the, like the, the, these rules are, are met and the quality is there. And then you can focus on the user flows, on the use cases, on how your API works all, all together. Focus on the high level API design, basically. Got it. And effectively, it sounded like it's, uh, it, there's not a lot of sort of full-time capacity on this this sort of governance function uh, at that sort of call it 50 people scale, right? Yeah, totally, totally. Of course, so we have to create a product. We have to serve our customers and also, of course, build the APIs, make sure they're good. So it's very, very challenging. And I like it so far, but we need more people. Yeah, I know. Trust me, I know the feeling. Um, Alex, how, how big is advanced? And uh, you already mentioned, I think it was 11 people on uh, on the team heading up the governance stuff. Yeah, that's right. So we're in the same situation Alexi was. So we got about 3,000 people globally. 
but th that in turn brings its own challenges of you know people speaking different primary languages in different time zones how do you meet the needs of all of those api reviews you know with a small collection of people and you know we go out and meet small startups and they're you know people are like i've just got a product out the door i just need my, my next bit of money what might want to cause my growth, want to get more people in. So, you know, how do we get people in that situation going, if I if I lay really good foundations, you know, we're going to be able to grow uh, and our APIs are going to be good from the get go. So it's how do we enable people of all sizes? You know, if you're a big monolith and you've got loads of people, you can probably afford to have some people paid on the payroll that just deal with this stuff. But if you're a small firm, it's just not affordable. But how do we cater to those people? How do we bring them along so that as they grow and become more successful, you know, as you said, you've had a little little bit of a part in that. That's the best thing about enablement. We talk about it a bit like, you know, if, if you were make if you were shooting a film, you've got these star actors at the front, and then you've got the people that, you know, build all of the props behind the camera, the people that make them look good. That that's really what this enablement's all about. And when you're a startup, you're probably a person, you know, shooting on your own camera but you're getting more and more people around you, your stuff's going to get better and you're just going to keep winning. Some days you're just craft services or, or uh, you know, therapy services. Yeah, you could be anything in a small place. Yeah. Uh, but to your point, Alex, it's like uh, the, the larger organizations sometimes are like a collection of smaller organizations. Uh, and I'm sure, Mike, you're feeling this one uh, at gargantuan Microsoft scale. Yeah. Yeah. There's got to be yeah. pockets that you play in there. Right. Yeah. And and really our our focus is just Azure, uh, not sort of the there's there's parts outside of Azure, you know, Microsoft Graph, for example, or Teams or things like that, that we really don't uh, get involved with. But but Azure, you know, over 200 services, uh, just tons and tons of APIs. And like you said, there, there are the little fiefdoms within there, you know, there's the cognitive services that all do things one way. And then there's, you know, uh, maps, which actually came in as an acquisition some number of years ago, and they had things that were, were all doing things their way. Um, so yeah, uh, we, we have to deal with all that. Uh, we have a team of, uh, I would say eight, core members and then a, a few more, uh, maybe up to a dozen that uh, participate um, depending upon what, what services that we're reviewing. So that's that's about the size of our team. Um, and, you know, we're reviewing APIs every week, um, you know, uh, trying to uh, not, again, not be burdensome, but be be helpful to teams as they as they roll out new features and, and try to come to market. I'm going to go ahead and stay on top of questions here as they come in, partially to encourage the audience here. Like, don't be shy about asking questions. You got a group of really smart people who know this stuff. Uh, let's be blunt way better than I do. Uh, so take advantage. Uh, first question is, if your org has an API consistency problem, what recommendations do you have for applying new API style guides to existing APIs? I'll well, jump in on this one and say, involve people. In, in originally, we took a style guide and said, this is what we shall do. We took Zalendo's actually, shout out to, it seems that as Zalendo and Adidas and people that sell clothes have got really good APIs. Yeah. We took that on board and then immediately our JSON, our, our JavaScript dev said, we don't like snake case. Can we have camel case please? And then we kind of realized we've got to do a little bit of involve all of the people uh, and some good champions came out of that as well. and if you can be a bit democratic and ask for people's opinions and pe make help them feel involved because we want people to be involved uh, we found that adoption was a lot easier that way rather than saying hi we've been told we're important you need to do it this way i didn't yeah, uh, yeah sorry sorry go ahead Alex. oh thank you so i've been in this situation and uh yeah we struggled a lot basically the first learning that we had even if we have a brilliant idea in mind that this API should look like this, should behave this way, we also should, of course, look at the majority of cases, how it's implemented right now. And if it's 80-20, then, of course, the consistency is the key. So probably we should sacrifice this ideal perfect vision, and we should make sure that everything is consistent with existing APIs, because otherwise you're introducing breaking changes, you're breaking existing client integrations, and it will be very hard for them and for you as well. 
Uh, the second point uh, that we try to implement is to make sure how we can uh, introduce these uh, new rules gradually, especially if we can compare and apply this rule set only to the changes that the, the new API endpoints that, that, that were implemented recently, th this was a great success because in this case, we just ignored the existing uh, APIs for some time. Maybe they will gradually just like be sunsetted and we don't need even to change them. Maybe we need to have a strategy to evolve them as well, but just uh, like make sure every time you implement the rule, you can also apply it differently to different parts of your API um, collection. Basically, that's what helped us. Yeah, and uh, I guess from my point of view, so uh, in addition to being on the uh, API stewardship board, I'm also on the Azure Breaking Changes Review Board. And so um, our our policy is the, the first rule is don't break customers. So if you have an existing API, uh, you don't change it to, to follow a style guide uh, that you, you just, if it, that is to say, if it's GA, now, if it's something that's preview and you you know let out there for people to use, then okay, then then we can change it. But but once it goes GA, you don't change it. Um, and then just to pick up on something that Alexi said, um, yes, uh, apply the lint rules to things that have changed. Uh, and it turns out that this is really easy to do with Spectral. I, I wrote a little tool that will uh, take the prior version of the API and the current version of the API, run spectral on both of them, take the JSON output, and from the JSON output, you can actually compare what are the things that are new, and then it'll just show me those. Um, so uh, so yes, that that's a very important technique as well. Mike, is that a tool that you've open sourced, or is this just in your little toolbox? It's it's like about a 10 line shell script. So I'm happy to open source. I haven't open sourced it, but I'd, I'd be happy to. Yeah, you should. That sounds handy. Uh, I know this is, it's always a topic, right? Uh, yeah. I, I think the bit I would add to this conversation is, um, I think in the bigger picture, sometimes folks look and say, well, we have this kind of mess of APIs that we built. How do we make it all consistent? And quite often the answer is you don't. You need to like define new APIs and move on um, because you can't change the stuff that's already being used without it being breaking changes to make it consistent, right? Um, and when you start that new sort of archaeological layer, um, you know, have the basic rules in place before you get started. Uh, I think for some companies, that is a much faster path to kind of creating a cleaner, newer environment than it is trying to go clean up old things that you will learn that you can't change. So, all right, I guess before I get too far into this question, does is anybody really familiar here with JSON API? Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. Okay, well, we have a question. I'll throw it out there. We may all shrug and move on and apologize because uh, the JSON API thing is sort of not everywhere. Uh, we're making a new public API, and in order to make it consistent, we've decided to follow JSON API guidelines. The thing is that it doesn't describe how to handle file management. So it defines strict structure for the body of content type, and it's not suitable for files. How would you suggest to handle it? And there's sort of an example here, but uh, anyone have a good idea on this? Well, I'll just say that... Um... Handling file input or or output, um, even from regular open API, is is troublesome and difficult. Um, and there's too many ways to do it, and too many ways to do it wrong. Um, what we try to encourage people to do is uh, just pass the the file in a body um, as application octet stream uh, whenever you can. Uh, but there are plenty of times that that people want to know additional metadata, like you know what was the file name on the client, or what was you know pass a different um, uh, mime type than application like text stream, and then so then they resort to uh, multi-part form data, which uh, 
is is difficult, <laughs> but works. Um, so uh, I I don't know that there are any real good patterns for this. I guess is is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I agree with you on this one. That it's there's probably it's sort of like you know how do I escape this problem? It's like don't get into it in the first place. Because uh, I I apply the same thinking as like encoding the the binary data from a file into a field so that you can uh, also provide additional metadata is usually a better approach uh, than trying to pass around octet streams. It's just none of the tooling works right uh, across the board. Uh, I don't know, uh, Alexi, uh, Alex, if you guys have dealt with this from a design standpoint too. I, I always go on the law of astonishment or least astonishment. You know, what do you look at that kind of doesn't make you go, Whoa, that, I, I can see a couple of people grimacing when we're, we're talking about multi-part file uploads. Um, think i'll give away one of my secrets uh, there's a app there's a repo on github called api gurus and that's mm -hmm. a, a place where they scrape thousands of api definitions so you can just jump onto there and search that repo and be like what's what results have we got for file upload and you get your little accounts of how many people have done it so if you ever need to kind of dip test and say am i doing something that everyone's going to go i've never seen that before maybe try maybe try api gurus um, i'll put a little thing in the chat for it um you know, it's don't be astonishing, I guess, is one of the things. What would PayPal do? What would Microsoft do? Or what would what would Mike Slot do? Go and have a look and see what the kind of the leaders are going to be doing there. And then that'll hopefully set you on the right path. There's definitely no shame in stealing design patterns and APIs. <laughs> what what, <laughs> or what would Chat GPT do? I guess that's the yeah, 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 one. No one said it yet. Here we go. Okay, uh, actually, yeah, yeah. sorry. It, it's a good topic, but um, joke aside, I invited ChatGPT to some of our API review sessions as a as a virtual member, and it it was it was not super helpful all the time. But first of all, it was fun, and then also it, it was just you know some a, a, a extra input, and and then this helped us to shape shape an opinion. Uh, put it this way. Uh, regarding file management, I think we currently decided to go with uh, multi-part form data because it was already implemented this way in fast API framework that we're using for our backend. It was just straightforward, but obviously, and also I think it's more performant than uh, dealing with uh, encoded uh, data strings. But obviously, the same uh, standpoint about metadata. So how do you annotate this? Then you just need to add more, basically, payloads and link to each other, and the, the whole API becomes more complicated. That's how I see this. And this is, I think, a very common situation when you discuss uh, your API style guides and you may need to make a decision because every decision has its pros and cons and you need to pick one that fits best currently like your design and your users and just go with that. Um, that's my take on it. Um, there was a tail end to this question that I'll answer real quick, which is, are there any predefined rules in Spectral for popular guidelines? Uh, we'll post the link, but if you go to apistylebook.stoplight.io, um, we have a slowly growing collection of uh, common rules, uh, as well as things like Alex had mentioned earlier, uh, the Zalando rule set. So we've looked for like popular style guides that are out there that we could, uh, you know, sort of publish and make available to the community. Uh, let's see, we got one more question. Uh, when it comes to an API, when you publish it, you own it. How do you convince existing consumers to invest in migrating to your new API when you learn from your bad interface definitions? So uh, I'm just going to say, I don't think this is exactly a style guide uh, question, but I think it's okay. We've probably all dealt with this issue enough to have uh, uh, interesting opinions that might be valuable. Uh, so. <laughs> have you guys uh, ever migrated trying to move off old APIs? <laughs> yeah. Any advice? Um, I I can go first if, sure. if it's okay. Basically, I migrated customers who integrated ten years ago. And, and this was a, re a really big pain. So basically, this uh, usually you start preparing this migration well in advance. Like it can take, it can easily take a year, uh, and you need to understand uh, the amount of the complexity 
and what's going on. So, so basically, you start with API archaeology. You try to understand what's there, how how many endpoints, how many versions, who is still using that, and then see who are the the, big, the biggest clients on this API, and then. Um, Obviously, there is no like common incentive for them to migrate, but quite often uh, it starts even earlier. So basically, in your service agreement, it's very handy when you have some clause uh, that allows you actually to deprecate and sunset some part of your API. So that's uh, you really need to have for sure. If you don't have it, then you're in a big trouble. Uh, but then, of course, uh, you need to make easy for these clients to integrate to a new API, and you need to show that after they migrate to this new API version, uh, it will be also a big benefit for them, like a big uplift in, I don't know, payments acceptance rates, or much better user experience, or much more reliable integration. So just try to prepare, uh, try really to also sell it to these clients in the right way, and after that, they will migrate. Yeah, carrots, not sticks, right? Boss. <laughs> Boss. Alex, Mike, you got anything? I'm going to name drop Mike. Um, when we chatted the other day, you talked about versioning, and, and Alex has just triggered me on that. Like, that's probably one of the most important versioning policy and a, a rule set that says any APIs must be versioned. That's probably one of the only you must you shall not pass go without it because you're already setting that expectation to say, here's version one, there's going to be a version two at some point, but we are going to try our utmost not to go there. But you see so many APIs without any version numbers in it. And then you go, how is it they versioned? Are they doing headers? Are they doing, we, we did a whole look into, into versioning and to choose one. And it's, it's the same as the question we had about uploads is that they're the kind of things that anytime somebody asks you something different, that's the time that your call to action to say, if there isn't a standard, we probably need to get one. And then that's where you can involve other people and say, hey, what will we do for our versioning policy? Are we going to do it, you know, major integer versions? We're we going to do it in headers, you know, involve people around you and then decide henceforth from today, anything new looks like this. And you're going to save so much time on just regular teams coming in saying, how do we do versioning here? You go, it's over here. Or hopefully you've got it in your style, guys. They don't even talk to you. They just go, oh, brilliant. That's how we version. And how much time have you just saved them in terms of researching on Stack Overflow and being told off like I was for asking opinion-based questions, <laughs> not facts. Um, <laughs> so it, it's, you know, get out there, get, get a version out there, and then uh, eventually it will come for you. But hopefully you have a good time on your first version and you can provide enough business benefits on your version two from all the things you learn that the customer will go, yeah, I can see there's a killer new feature I want in version two. You know, mm -hmm. And then they're, they're going to come across, but it's going to take a while. But be versioned, be ready for it, and then they will be ready for it as well, or at least ready for the conversation. Alex, I think that's a great segue for us to uh, fill out our last five minutes here. And uh, I would suggest maybe we kind of go rapid fire uh, is... What do you think kind of the uh, the essentials are to defining your rule sets? You already said versioning as being a clear one, and I, we're all head nodding here. Yeah, like make sure you have that defined. Uh, what else do you guys think are important? Uh, what about you, Mike? Uh, I think the essential is is not necessarily a set of rules so much as a rationale for your rules. You need to be able to sell your rules um to the service teams that that you're working with and say this is why these things are important right you have to have that that basis um to be able to say you know if you don't do this bad things will happen and 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 maybe even point to some examples this is where that bad thing happened in the past right um and and we want to avoid that so that's why we that's why we have this rule so just just a great rationale for your rules i think is really important I love that. Yeah. And I totally second the uh, explain what happens if you don't. It's a lot better than why you should. Mm -hmm. uh, Alexi, what do you got? I totally agree with Mike. Basically, even before going into explaining your style guide, you need to make sure there is a mindset, there is a culture, there is obsession with good API design and flaws. And that's why I think in every good API style guide, usually the first section is, okay, we're API first. This is how we do it. This is why it's important. Please check it out. Everything else comes after that. Everything else can be added. But uh, this understanding is super crucial. 
At the same time, every style guide covers the same things. Should it be stake case or camel case? Should it be this security scheme or this that security scheme? Should it be, I don't know, uh, like oh, all, all, all the same foundational stuff. And in my dream, uh, what we also discussed with Alex and Mike the other day, it should be some, you know, like a checklist of visual constructor for any style guide. I pick pick uh, this uh, style and this preferences, everything else is generated, everything else maybe is uh, even more detailed and more subjective, but this uh, sh should be the foundation and this should be everywhere. For me, it's security. You must have security. You must have it in your designs. Um, I've seen APIs before that have been caught out by that. They haven't put it in the design, so it hasn't been implemented. So making sure that you've got robust authentication and authorization. Um, shout out to the fantastic team at apisecurity.io. They do a weekly newsletter. And still now there are, oh, Peloton release a Peloton's API got done last year because it had no security at all. So they added API key security to it. So you got someone's API key and you still got carte blanche access. It's have it in your designs. And you know, Spectral is a great way that you can shift really left and say, hi, you've got no security, or hey, why are you using basic course? Please don't use that. You know, we've got a we've got Azure AD for OAuth 2. Use that instead. So th that would be the, the non-negotiable for me is uh, security at the very beginning. And it's a chance then for people to learn a little about security as well, because OAuth 2 is complex and lots of people are still learning it. Yeah, it's it's definitely one when I hear folks talk about using like log analysis to find security problems in their APIs. I'm like, that's fine, but did you check everything when you designed it? Because you could save like 80% of the problem ever existing in your logs. <laughs> um, so little plug for, again, that API stylebook.stoplight.io. We also have the OWASP top 10, uh, which actually is in the process of hopefully being updated with uh, all the recent changes here shortly. Uh, so that's an easy way to go turn that on. Uh, and I'll give a, a small plug for the Stoplight platform side too, uh, that it's pretty easy to basically just go pick the things that you want uh, to turn on if you don't know how to write all these style guides um, for a, a pretty cheap price. So there, that's all the stoplight shilling I'll do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I think we're at time. Is that right, Bailey? We're, uh, yep, we're you are correct, unless anyone has any more questions. Cool. I don't see any more popping up. Last chance, last call. Anybody got a burning question? Don't be an introvert. All right. Well, I guess we'll call that a wrap, guys. Uh, thank you so much for coming and uh, and sharing your knowledge. And uh, we'll obviously put out some content around this to help uh, you know get folks in touch with you if they kind of want to reach out, learn more. Um, I'm going to really double down on uh, something. I think it was um, Alex said earlier that we've really got to encourage folks to to share what you're doing, open source your spectral definitions. I'll say from Stoplight's perspective on trying to lead the future of development of this, uh, it's really hard for us to figure out how people are using it if you don't share it. And I think for practitioners like ourselves here, it's really hard to know, you know, it's kind of like Alex was saying, you go to something like APIs Guru, go find what other people have done. Like, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, let's share this stuff, really, you know, connect as a community and figure out the best patterns forward. So thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.